Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you, and thank you for the opportunity to extend the gospel or present the gospel message to you. And it begins in John chapter 21 and verse number 15. John 21, 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. What a question to ask. To ask Peter, do you love me? Husbands, if your wife asks you, do you love me, you've got trouble. <laughs> got big trouble. Do you love me, honey? Oh, buddy. A little background. A few weeks before this question was put to Peter, Peter had made a great boast about uh, being willing to die for Jesus in defense of him. He would never deny him. He would defend him even if it meant losing his life in doing so. In other words, he vowed to remain steadfastly committed and loyal to Jesus no matter what. Of course, you know how that turned out. <laughs> dramatically opposite you might say very much the opposite you know that Jesus informed him even when saying such as that that it would be well let's just put it in our way of wording it before sunup you will have denied me three times we're not talking in your lifetime we're not talking about next year next month next week we're talking about before the sun comes up you will have not denied me once or even twice but three times and he did in the days since then, Jesus has died, been buried, and has arisen from the grave. And though Peter and others have seen him even after the resurrection from the dead on a few select occasions, they're not though walking with him daily, and that's God's will. I'm not saying they should have, they just weren't. Walking daily with him like they had been prior to his death. How much that played a part in what I'm mainly speaking about, I'll just leave that to your own speculation. The sea, which you can see in the background of the little photo here behind me, the depiction of it, the sea is the Sea of Tiberias. It's back up north in Galilee as opposed to Jerusalem where the death of Jesus took place. And it's an early morning appearance, and the Lord appears to seven men. We don't know the names of all, but we do know one of them is Peter. Do you love me more than these, Peter? These what? We're not told. Is it these fish? They have been out fishing, you know. They had just finished eating fish and bread, verse 13 says. And so is it, do you love me more than fish or fishing, the fishing business? In verse number three, Peter and others had gone out all night prior to this fishing. In fact, they were still out there in the water when Jesus made an appearance at the shore. This was not likely night fishing that some seem to get a kick out of. My brother-in-law David Maravilla does, or at least used to. He'd go out fishing all night, and some of you may be in that camp and like that. This is not that. This is not Peter and others like to go fishing at night. This is more than likely a return to what they were professionally prior, three years prior, when Jesus called them to be his apostles. They were in the fishing business. They were in the fishing trade. So Jesus, if that's true, is saying, Peter, do you love me more than your job? Or how about this one? Peter, do you love me more than these? As he points to the other six individuals standing around the fire. Do you love me more than them? Maybe. It's not so much probably the idea that do you love me more than you love them, but do you love me more than they love me? I'm intrigued by that, to say the least. Sometimes you say things in response to what's said before. Jesus had not long before said, they may all forsake you, but I won't. Do you love me more than them? I surely won't, but you know how that turned out. So which is it? Love more than these, is it this, that, or the other? We don't know. God doesn't want to tell us that. I don't mean he's trying to keep a secret. It's just not necessary you know what that is. It doesn't matter, does it either? No. God has made it abundantly clear that our love for him must exceed any other these you want to put there. It doesn't matter. If a man loves father or mother more than me, you finish it. He's not worthy. worthy. Thank you. He's not worthy of me. And it doesn't matter, as I said, what these is. So whether it be love of others, love of money, love of your job, love of, love of yourself, it doesn't matter. 
Do you, me, do we love Jesus more than them or these? And what does Peter say? He says, I do love you. I wish I could tell the tone of some things said sometimes in the Bible. The Bible helps you on occasion. It'll indicate when he cried out to the Lord. You know, okay, I, that helps me to know how that was said. It was not like, you know, uh, in a mild tone voice. It was a cry out of some kind. But, you know, a lot, of the time, a lot of the times the Bible doesn't do that, though. It doesn't indicate to you the tone, the inflection of speech, the manner in which he was talking. And this is one of them. I wish I knew how he said, Lord, you know I love you. I've already told you by my speaking just as I did how I think it probably went. But that's just a guess. It's just a guess. Lord, you know. I can picture Peter not even looking him in the eye when he said it. Peter, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I love you. But that's just a guess, I know. But he's not through. He asks him again in verse 16. Jesus asks him a second time. Do you love me? But this time without qualification, meaning not saying, do you love me more than this or that? He just says, do you love me? And he's not through yet. He will ask him again in verse 17, do you love me? And John, who's writing this, says that Peter got grieved about it. You can see the verse behind me. He got grieved about it. He felt something emotionally in response to being asked a third time, do you love me? Question for you and me to think about a moment. Was Peter grieved because, well, in a sense, he was ticked off being asked three times? Lynette doesn't think so. Anybody else want to shake or not? I, I, I don't, I, maybe. I don't think he was ticked off. Maybe, maybe. I'll grant that there's a possibility that he was just aggravated. Would you stop asking me that? I doubt was going through his mind, nor was he saying that. But we know because John says it, he was grieved. Was Peter, Peter grieved in the sense that he's being asked over and over? Maybe. That he's getting mad? Maybe. I'm going to suggest another thought, and that is he's sorrowful about it. He's sad. We're getting a nod or two here. I am sad that it has come to this. He won't take my word for it. He asked me. I said I do, and that's not good enough for him. It is sad and sorrowful that it's come to this, that he has to ask me over and over, do you love me? I told you I did. Do you love me? I told you. I doubt he's saying, I told you I did. Mm -hmm. But he's having to hear it as if that's not good enough. Hey, stop. <laughs> sometimes do we, and this came up in class, sometimes do we need to have something hammered in two or three times before it really gets past your brain into your heart? Oh, absolutely. It can be one ear and out the other. We don't need that. Hit hard, hit hard, say it again, say it again, to where maybe it registers beyond your intellect. And maybe that's the case here. Maybe he's someone, and I don't know who said this first, but I'll, I'll just say I stole it somewhere. Somebody said that he's counteracting the three times that he had denied him. Nice imagination there. I'm not saying it's not the case. Maybe Jesus is saying, you denied me three times, I'm going to ask you three times, do you love me? <laughs> Maybe it is. Maybe it is. I don't know. But sometimes it takes a lot, right, to get the message through. I want to suggest to you that Peter's thinking about quitting the Lord. I worded this carefully, putting this together yesterday. I, I hope I'm not saying that incorrectly. I'll go with it, read it exactly as I have it written. I suggest that Peter is thinking of quitting the Lord because he feels worthless. He feels depressed. He feels useless. It reminds me of what God said to Elijah, a prophet of olden days, when he was afraid of a queen named Jezebel, everybody's heard of her, and depressed about the state of Israel at the time. And so what did he do? He went and holed himself up in a cave. You remember that? God says what to him? God says what to him? Three times. God says what to him? What are you doing here? What? No, let me word that What are you doing here? It's not so much what are you doing here, that's true too, but what are you doing here? Either way you want to word it. <laughs> Can I go ahead and put words in the Lord's mouth? Get up, Elijah. I've got work for you to do. Stop moping around, head, head hanging low, beating yourself up, wallowing in self-pity. Get back in the game. 
Well, he didn't say that. I just made that up. <laughs> but that's a gist of uh, thinking, I wonder. Well, okay, he didn't say all, all of it just that way. But maybe that's how it is with Peter. Peter, if you, if you love me, you said you do, right? Yes, three times. Yes, yes, yes. You love me? Get back in the game. I didn't train you for three years for you to go back to fishing. And I don't mean for a Saturday afternoon fun time. I mean leave the apostleship and go back to fishing as a living. Peter, if you love me, do what it is I call you to do. All right, three take-homes, and the lesson is yours. First one is this one. The most important question you can ever answer is, do you love Jesus? I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. I won't be awkwardly silent. Do you love Jesus? Not do you know a lot about him. I know you know a lot about him. Not that are you a member of his church. I know you were that. I know that. I'm not asking that. I didn't ask that. Not uh, do you work hard for Jesus. No. Do you obey Jesus? No. Do you suffer for Jesus? No. When I say no, I mean no. That's not what I'm asking. Those all may be true and some more as well. I didn't even ask if you've been baptized, but let's go ahead and throw that in for no extra cost. Do you love Jesus? That's the question. The greatest. Those others are good ones. Have you been baptized? Ron and I, when we're talking to people, we, whenever they're thinking about being members, we'll ask them about their baptism. It's a great question. Do you plan to work hard for the Lord? Or do you? That's a good one. Do you obey everything Jesus tells you to do? Yes, 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 yes. Here is the best or biggest or greatest question of all. The most important is how I got it worded on the notes behind me. Do you love Jesus? Can I get an amen on that? I have yes. one yet. Yes, absolutely true. I'm not trying to make you amen it, but I'd like it if you got if you agree. Those things are important though, Whit, aren't they? Isn't it important that I got baptized? Yes. Obey Jesus? Yes. Work hard, suffer, all of those that I mentioned a while ago. I even keep his commandments. And doesn't Jesus say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments? He does. But did you know you can keep the commandments and not love him? Oh yeah, we sometimes call them hypocrites. Oh yeah, there can, there can be people that are doing what the Lord says, but they don't have the love there. There's the love is missing. Jesus talked about some people that will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many things in your name? And it's not going to get them into heaven necessarily. It may, but I'm, it'll contribute, I should say. But it's not the only thing. The issue is, why are you obey, obey? Why are you obedient? It's important. Is it because you love Jesus? My friends, myself included, we've got to do some soul searching. And find out the truthful answer to this question. Hmm. Do I love Jesus? The kids do. They sing it all the time. Hmm. Oh, actually, that's Jesus loving them. But a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I bet you the children do, though. I'm going to bet you, and here's why. The Lord saw the little kids. They've got a leg into the kingdom already. Yeah. So maybe I wasn't too far off. Okay, two more and I'm done. No matter how great we fail Jesus, he stands ready to forgive us and give us a fresh start. Right, Sean? Absolutely. Right, Ryan? Absolutely. Any women? No, I better stay with the guys. <laughs> no matter how great we fail Jesus, he stands ready to forgive us and give us a fresh start. Peter so well illustrates this. These are three lessons to take away from our study thus far. The gospel message found in John 21. Peter illustrates so well, having failed, you're not necessarily through. Have you ever been haunted by failure? Has it ever been something that has been a um, quite the mental agony for you? Broken hearted because you betrayed a relationship? That's Peter. That's Peter. Listen to it. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. That's the, the betrayal according to Luke. That's the denial, I should say, according to Luke. Can't you just feel the pathos of those words? Anybody but me? I know I'm not the only one. While the words are still coming out of his mouth, Jesus being interrogated by the authorities in a room which Peter can see from the courtyard where he is standing around the fire, it says he turned and looked at him. I'm not an actor, but I can picture it well in my imagination. He's on the ground, we say, in the courtyard. He's been granted access through a gate by John. 
He's standing at, I'll make up a number, four o'clock in the morning around a fire. People are talking. He's being asked, you are being actually accused, asked and or accused. You, you know him. You, you're one of Jesus' disciples, right? He's denying. And then the rooster crows. And while he's even saying for the third time, I don't know him, the rooster crowing, Luke says, and Luke wasn't there, I don't think. The Holy Spirit was there, and he tells Luke to describe it this way, that Jesus turned and looked at him. He's being interrogated on the second floor, maybe the third. But in the courtyard, you can look up there and you can see Jesus probably with his back to the courtyard, standing something like this and he's being interrogated, basically saying nothing. They're just talking to him, charging him, trying to get him to a criminal, incriminate himself. And then the rooster crows. And at the exact same time, Peter for the third time is saying he doesn't know him. Peter turns and Jesus turns and looks at him. What kind of look was it, by the way? What kind of look was it? Was it a look? Was it, was it a look of disgust? Was it a look? Was it a look of see? I told you. Tim doesn't think so. I told you to deny me, and you said I wouldn't dare do such a thing. I told you. I don't think that's it. Was it a look of anger that he's mad? That's my problem, by the way. If that, if I was Jesus, I would have been mad at him. I get angry when I have this, when I'm disappointed in people. I, I don't know why I do that. I'm, I'm confessing now some things that maybe I shouldn't, but I get real mad at people not doing what they should do. And maybe I shouldn't. I don't think that's it. You know what I think it is? It, it was a look of love. Jesus loved Peter, praying so hard. The Bible says it. I'm not making this up. That he prayed so hard that his faith not falter. He says the devil sifted you, Peter. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's going to be anything left. And it almost disappeared. His faith in me. He's asking to sift you like wheat. I pray to God that you can survive this. In the nine, he's, he, he's basically, <laughs> he's an inch away of, uh, from not surviving it. You know what was good, though? What was good, that, what, it's good what Peter did. Luke says he he ran out. I mean, I, I think that literal. He ran out of the courtyard. And the Bible says he wept bitterly. He didn't just get a moist eye. He cried his eyes out. Have you ever? Oh, yeah, when my mom died, I did. No, I mean over something having to do with you and Jesus. <laughs> I don't get that word to pop up stuff like that. <laughs> when my mom died, I, saw, I cried a bit. But I'm just not the crying kind. The Bible doesn't exaggerate, at least not here. It does use hyperbole, but not here. He wept bitterly. You might, I thought you said that was a good thing. Oh yeah, the Bible says godly sorrow produces repentance. And that's what he's doing. As painful as those next few days must have been for Peter, at the same time, how reassuring it must be to see Jesus coming to find him. Jesus was not saying, he knows where to find me. If he wants my forgiveness, he knows where to find me. See, that's quick talk. Wade, I'll pick on you. If Wade slapped me and I really felt wrong by him slapping me in the face, he was so mad at me at something, and somebody says, somebody says, don't you want to go pass things up with uh, Wade? Because I'm not Jesus, I'll probably say, he knows where to find me. He can even text, he can call, whatever. If he wants to, I'll, I'll accept his forgiveness or his offer for you know forgiveness and so forth. But I'm not Jesus. I need to be Jesus. Jesus goes to find him. And the Bible encourages me, if somebody has a lot, go try to straighten it out. Well, he's the one that got the problem, not me. See how far we have to grow? Jesus didn't rub Peter's nose in it. No. I was surprised when putting this together, he doesn't even mention the denial. At least not recorded. If, it's, if, it, if it was mentioned, it's not recorded as mentioned. He doesn't go to... Peter and says, I want to talk a little bit about what you did to me? Or didn't do to me? For me? No. As far as I know, there's no mention of it. My friends, no matter how bad our life, 
If your life has been murderous, persecuting Christians like the Apostle Paul, you can find mercy in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, you can. If it's been full of denial and blaspheme, one in which you have publicly cursed and sworn oaths against God, condemning you and your family to an eternal hell, if I'm not telling the truth, I don't know him, uh, well, you can be forgiven. Yes, you can, Peter, and now you. Even if you've been a, a traitor, you could trade him for money, one in which you've sold out the Lord for some earthly gain. Don't do as Judas did. Don't do as Judas did. Rather, Judas could have been forgiven, and so could, and so can you. Okay, almost through. <laughs> Short but sweet, get to work. Get to work. God does not believe in probation. I know our, our court, uh, court system does, our judicial system does, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. God doesn't believe in probation. There was no need for Peter to keep his nose clean for six months, and I'll see about leaving you in the apostleship. I'm not exaggerating. No penance was required to prove he was sincere. No, if you love me, let's get to work. Now, let's get to work. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, and he did. Not exaggerating, days, days later, he's preaching Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem. It's singled out. I know Bartholomew said some stuff, but it's Peter and the apostles. He's not just dragging up the rear. Okay, our brother Peter, who denied the Lord, wants to say a few things about how sorry he is for none of that. He's out front leading the way. Peter and the rest of the apostles. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Brethren, we've got to get to work. God frees us from guilt and empowers us to be productive for good purposes. Do you see how terrible a thing it is then for us to handicap ourselves through an inability to forgive ourselves? I, I can a lot easier accept wage forgiveness than I can my own it's me, I can't forgive me. Peter was wrestling with that, it would appear. We mustn't let that happen. That's not the nature of true forgiveness. True forgiveness is forgiven and forgotten, and let's go forward. True love forgives and gets to work. If we truly love God, then receive the forgiveness and get busy doing good. Thank you. If we want to know what love means, we don't have to pick up a dictionary. Just read the story of Jesus and Peter. Love is forgiveness. Love is reconciliation. Love is renewal. And through Jesus or Christ, all of us, undeserving as we are, can be forgiven and restored if we love Jesus. Amen.